Hello, everyone. And here we are with another episode of Safe to Be. I'm super excited and honored to have Bill Wagner as our guest. And there's so much to talk about, Bill. And I would like to like him to do the talking today. But so yes, he has been uh, he's, he has been fabulous throughout his career, and he has been so much motivated and uh, has inspired so many lives and journeys. So uh, we'll we'll get right to it. But before I would want Bill to say something. Oh. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, come on, hello everybody. Um, I'm happy you invited me to come here and and chat, and uh, I'm excited to see what all of you do on on your journeys. So, um, Bill, we'll just uh, get to the questions, I guess, if that's fine. Sure. Okay. So, the first question that I have is, um, when did you find out that you are passionate about tech, and like, was it college? And also, starting your career as a member of scientific staff, what's the story? Okay, so this would have been back in the 80s. In high school, I started to do some some simple things just with a, a computer we had in the math department. Uh, that was it was all um, programming and basic. And I was lucky enough to have a really good math teacher that let us do interesting things in that when we get to this point like in in upper algebra and when you start getting into geometry and calculus um you know where you're doing kind of similar problems and you have to do like 20 of them to get all the practice and so on uh, myself and a couple of other friends started writing small programs on you know these computers the math department had to do our homework and he gave us credit for that because, as he put it then, is if you can write something for the computer to do these problems, you don't need to do you know, 20, 30 problems by hand. Um, so I really enjoyed that. At the same time, though, I was really, really enjoyed physics mostly and started college. I was going to be ahead uh, of uh, getting a mechanical engineering degree and one semester in I found I liked software a lot more than building things, so I switched majors to uh, computer science and engineering and went through the rest of the undergrad program there. Um, the, um, the position for member scientific staff, that was basically just the terminology used by the company was Bell Northern Research, which was the research arm for the Canadian telephone company, um, at that time, Northern Telecom. And a lot of what we were doing then was research for networking and office automation and you know related uh, technology there. So there was a lot of really interesting forward thinking things that we were doing in terms of, like we had, it was just inside we basically had screen sharing working on ASCII terminals if it was inside the same LAN on the same phone switch. Um, you know, this is 1987, so it was it was some interesting things that we got to do there. Um, and what I worked on primarily there was developer tools, uh, either change management systems or um, other things that were debugging the uh, telephony network and so on. And uh, just kept going from there, learning new things and seeing things I found really interesting, and kept pursuing those. Wow, that's that quite a journey. Might have got you a bit nostalgic. <laughs> um, that's fun. So, so yeah, uh, and then there comes the question that's uh, that's like um, after 14 years of your journey as a CEO and with your company being recognized as the fastest growing company in America, not only once, but twice and various other milestones that uh, that you achieved as a CEO. So what was your journey as a CEO and why did you make the decision of selling the firm with so many establishments on the list and that passive growth? So um, a lot of different things. and. First was sort of how we grow the grew the firm. It, it kind of grew by accident, in that uh, my co-founder and I were both uh, strong software people, and what we really enjoyed was building the software. 
And the reason we formed a company together is as independents, we found that we kept bringing each other in for to work on, on each other's projects. And, you know, kept referring things to each other and then started working together. And our original vision would have been something that was more of a collaboration of consultants. And that really didn't, wasn't going very far. But what we found was having one of us as a lead and bringing in you know, more people that we could work with and help grow, build stronger project teams. So that was kind of how we grew the firm is over the next, well, it would have been 13 years, we kept getting larger and larger projects and then kept hiring more developers to help us do larger and larger projects up until 2013. And the reason for selling it is once we got to, once we got probably as far as 2011 or so, so about, you know, once we were kind of part, a good ways up that growth, a lot of our time was no longer involved in the technology part and in building the software or designing the software or any of the things that we really enjoyed doing and the things that we started the company to do. But so much of our time was now spent running the business, finding new projects, finding new, uh, you know, new work for our teams as they finished a different project. And that was not, neither our strong suit, you know, it wasn't what we were best at, nor was it what we wanted to spend our days doing. Um, and we looked around and started to look a little bit to see if we could find someone else to do more of the sales kinds of things and we could each take kind of restructure the company so we could take on more of the architecture and software development. Um, and we really didn't find anyone that fit the culture and fit the mold. And then we decided at that point that we were gonna uh, look for a buyer that, that fit our culture. Um, Atomic Object did that. They had a, a and, and they grew similar to what we did, but the difference was the three people they had in leadership really enjoyed, you know, finding the new leads and finding the projects to work on more than they enjoyed doing the software work. And uh, that was the reason why we, we accepted their offer, um, you know, which the good part was they kept everybody on staff because they really liked the culture we had built on building software. And then, um, again, their structure to be in the leadership, you had to be part of the sales. So, um, which was my whole reason for selling it in the first place. Uh, so that's when I went off to do um, work independently, teaching developers again, and then eventually landed at Microsoft. That's, that's, that's a great, incredible story. And then yes. those tough decisions and those firm, firm passion that you have, it's, it's fascinating. Wow. Uh, um, um, I'm blown. So uh, yeah, coming up with the next question. So we uh, we know that you are the co-founder of the Humanitarian Toolbox, and it is an open source software to support disaster relief efforts. So can you tell me more about it and how code saves lives? And is there anything we are getting on COVID-19? Um, yeah, so, so here's sort of the backstory on that. And this there's a theme that's kind of running through these answers that I'll get to at the end of this one is what's where we started Humanitarian Toolbox. And this was also probably 2013, 2014. So shortly after we'd sold SRT Solutions, a group of friends um, spearheaded primarily by Richard Campbell, who is one of the hosts of .NET Rocks, among other things. And they were approached by Microsoft that Microsoft wanted to do something code for good to support the Visual Studio launch. And Richard really took that to heart, but had a couple really strong requests for it. The main one being that it had to be something that was sustainable, meaning that we had to, you know, it, it couldn't be one of these, okay, so we're gonna write some code and now we're just gonna disappear and people get to use it. We wanted to form some kind of a structure so that whatever got done would be software that was going to be maintained and installed and supported for these organizations that aren't software organizations but that want to use software and could benefit from it 
And our original model was looking around to see somebody had to be doing this because it was just such an obviously good idea, right? Software to help aid humanitarian relief efforts. And we couldn't find anything. There did not seem to be any charity actually doing that, at least not in a sustainable way. Um, and we really didn't like partnering with any of the companies that put software in the disaster relief effort. Um, and in part because the cost structure wasn't right. And there was a lot of, uh, you know, and that made it hard for them to really get their software getting used because um, people didn't want to change habits in a disaster. So that was when we formed the charity with the idea that we could build software working with charitable organizations in advance of an event. And by doing it that way, what we would hope was the people who would be on the ground during a disaster would already be familiar with the software and then they could use it effectively and um, make a difference rather than trying to train people to use new software when a disaster happened um, when you know there there's more, much more urgent needs for one and the last thing you want to try to do is take a trained team and change how they do something in a crisis so that was where we started um, and then with the help of another of the founders, Tony Surma, at that time was the director of Microsoft Disaster Relief, which was an organization inside of Microsoft Philanthropies. And what they are responsible for is they will supply resources in times of crisis to local governments, to NGOs or non-government agencies. Um, or national and international organizations that are in support of disasters. Um, they usually do it very quietly um, and just help get things done. And then, so we kind of partnered with them to learn more about what software would be useful and what things we could try to build. And you know, we filled an Azure DevOps board with like 30 different ideas that came from all over. And we looked for ones that were um, really baked well. So they had good requirements that we've, and we felt that the technology was um, mature enough to make it work. So we started with that and we then slowly proved that Yes, we can bring developers together to build things that will help people on a volunteer basis if there's the structure around it and if there are project leaders in place that can help define what has to get built. And then the third thing that we really added once we started working on already, which was our second big project, was that to really make it work well, we had to have a representative from an agency who could really help define the requirements and say, okay, these features are the things that we'll really use. Yeah, you're looking at that. I understand what you're saying. Developer people with cool ideas, we won't use that. And we could kind of help focus it and, and make sure that the development fit what people were gonna use. Um, and that also helped drive the development a little bit because what we could do then is, as we're looking for volunteers and looking for people to work on it, you know, we could point out, you know, hey, Jim is here from the Red Cross. He is telling us what features he needs. So if you help us on these features, yes, that's going to get used. Your volunteer time is is going to have an impact. Um, and that's where we're sitting now. And now, uh, in terms of COVID. Um, because we're in the midst of the crisis, it is hard to get reasonable requirements to build something for working with COVID. And it's also, there are some really specialized research being done on modeling, on uh, molecular biology, uh, machine learning, and um, uh, What's the term I want? Um, you know, the pandemic research to look at. You know, how can we look at the big data sets from what we see and start to learn things? Uh, there are other researchers really doing that, so our best move is just stay out of their way, um, because there are some there are some really big research arms looking at that. What we are doing, and I know when we met last week, I said I think we'd have the board ready. We don't. It's probably going to be about three days. 
So we're about to launch a project that is kind of retargeting something that was originally going to be built for earthquake preparedness that will now be for COVID quarantine preparedness. And a key thing about it is because it's built for preparedness, it's also applicable to areas that might be prone to hurricanes or typhoons or blizzards or forest fires. You know, are you ready for two weeks without power? or two weeks without running water or whatever it may be and what kind of things should you be ready for and then it's also tied into in this instance for earthquakes the um, u.s geological survey data so it will be able to give alerts if there are early tremors going and again you can adapt that for other weather events like right now there's tropical depression four is forming off the atlantic so you can You know, this would be a good time for people in the southeastern United States to think about what the plan would be if it turns into a hurricane. You know, don't panic, don't do anything crazy, but, you know, do you have gas and oil for the generator? Do you have drinking water at home? You know, do you know, do you have all the documents you need if you need to evacuate and so on? That kind of preparedness. And again, that gets to our model of trying to build software that's useful in multiple situations so that the charities can keep using it. Um, And I know because you asked, we're going to get that, get a board launched with tasks for people to volunteer on in, within a week, we've got a meeting tomorrow where I think we'll be getting ready to kick it off. And I'll respond in the chat here once that that board's live to um, put a link if people want to work on it. Um, And as I said, kind of getting onto these answers, it's kind of a theme here in terms of looking at where you want to go. Um, if you look at how we we look at problems as we're and, and how we want to solve them, um, a technique I use fairly often is something called mind mapping, where I start with looking at what skills I have right now and, and where I'm at. I might look at something kind of off in the distance and say, this is really where I want to go. This is an end destination. And then I start trying to build some kind of a map from here's where I am, there's where I want to go, and then around where I am, there are choices I can make. Which of those choices and actions takes me where I want to go? You know, so yeah, yeah. relating that back to HTBox, the first thing we wanted to do is, well, can we actually get volunteers to build software? Can we partner with charities to get some good requirements? Can we get charities to deploy these applications? Now can't now we're up to can we build something sustainable that will continue to be useful over a period of years and host it and get it updated and so on. So we keep trying one new thing and keep trying to get closer to the vision where we set out for, you know, when we first founded it. Oh, oh. I mean that's I mean, a whole lot whole lot of process. process. I can hear myself. I guess. I guess. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Okay. Um, sorry, I guess sorry, I can I guess. hear. Is there an? Hello. Um, I can hear you. Okay. Yeah. Now I guess it's uh it's fixed. Uh, there okay. was something with my mic. Um, so yeah, coming back, uh, um, I was just saying that it's a whole lot of a process and there's so much into this and uh, coming up to, uh, I would also add up to the question that uh, we can uh, do, it's an open source thing and we can also yes. contribute. So yep. how, uh, is there is there any, uh, any tip that you want to give and anything that you want to say about uh, how should we start with contributions over this? Okay, so uh, there there are two applications right now, and if you go to github.com slash htbox, that will show the open applications right now. Um, one of them is one that helps find missing children in or, or helps parents create information on their phones or store information on their phones so that if a child goes missing, they'll be able to have everything ready to help identify, you know, get the authorities all the pertinent information that could be useful, you know, like height, weight, hair color, recent pictures, who their friends were that they remember being around in the past week, so on and so forth. Um, 
and any any of those kinds of things. And then uh, already, which is one that kind of helps track volunteers on any kind of a a a campaign through um, through a city, through a region to get some some behavior to change. And then the third one will start uh, shortly. And I would look at the issues. Um, our goal is to have issues set up at a task level where the issue should give a pretty clear statement of what has to happen. Um, and then where I would start is find one that you think you're both interested in and looks like something you could do. Add a comment saying, hey, I want to work on this. Who can help? Or, you know, what more information do you have? Can you assign it to me? Whatever. And our project leader who well, on the new project is going to be a lady named Carrie Payette. We'll probably respond going, hey, great. Here's how you build it. You know, ping me uh, with anything, any questions, and then just get started. Um, and definitely ask questions. Uh, GitHub is great for that collaboration of, you know, sure. here's questions I have on the issue. As soon as you can, open up a branch with a pull request that's a draft and say, here's the direction I'm going. Is this right? Do you have any comments? And just try to get get the feedback that you can as you get started. And uh, the further you go, the more comfortable you'll get. Yeah, sure. Uh, um, so how, uh, there's another question. So how did you start as a tech content writer? And like there were numerous blogs I could see and you published four books. Uh, and what's the story there? Um, this one, yeah, there, there's a lot of story there. I, um, I had lived in Ann Arbor for quite a while and one of the, my mentors there was a gentleman named Richard Hale Shaw, who wrote for PC Magazine, probably in its heyday, about the Windows 3.1 era, you know, very early 80s and, uh, and so on. And I had expressed to him that I wanted to start writing and explaining things as I was starting to first do consulting on my own. And my reason for it, as I said, going back to kind of that mind mapping thing is in order to be a good consultant to help people build software better, you have to grow the skill of explaining things well. So writing a monthly column is a good way to do that. And he worked with me to get my first article published uh, from our project that I was working on at that time for a company that was doing uh, game development for Disney and was part of working on a project that was also being uh, promoted by Microsoft um, that fed into the first version of DirectX uh, way back at that time and got started there. And then Richard went off and founded a new magazine called Visual Studio, or at the time it was Visual C++ Developers Journal, and a corresponding conference, Visual C++ Developers Conference. And because he knew that I wanted to do more writing and had agreed to help mentor when, when it made sense, uh, he asked me to be their fundamentals columnist for C++. So now I'm writing a monthly column on C++ in the 90s, and that magazine merged and grew, kind of merged with what was at the time VBits, which was, was a visual, uh, excuse me, visual basic developers magazine. And somewhere around 2000, C++ fundamentals was getting very hard to write about because it was a very mature language. And it was a language that wasn't attracting a lot of new developers as much anymore because uh, Java had just come out. Well, and about that same time was when Microsoft got sued by um, Sun and moved everybody that was on the J++ team into this new language called C Sharp that um, was being developed. So I got, by working on the magazine, I got alpha bits to start playing with, to start writing about C Sharp before it was released. Really liked it and have been working to help explain C, C Sharp and .NET to developers ever since. Um, and where I still write about it now is because the .NET ecosystem is still growing. So we are getting 
new developers who are either coming from other environments or have never written software before or are learning and they've you know had um, academic experience but have not um, either don't know C uh, sharp or haven't worked on larger projects yet so there is still a lot of things to keep covering and to keep bringing back and the way the language keeps changing we're bringing in new ways for uh, new techniques to, to solve different problems. Um, so I still get to have a lot of fun explaining that to people. Um, and I had wanted to write a book. The first one I wrote was for a publisher called Coriolis. And they went out of business two weeks after the book was published. So the first printing got done and that was it. Um, barely made the advance. Um, and I said, yeah, this is no fun. Um, what I mean by barely making the advance for folks that aren't familiar with this, when you write a book, the way you get paid for it is you will get an advance against royalties. And then they start filling that number once it starts selling. And you will make like roughly 10% of the sale and on each book goes back to the author and then 10 to 15 percent and then once you fill the advance then you actually start getting checks for future sales um so the publisher going out of business really meant i was not going to make much money on it at all um and then a couple years after that an acquisitions editor talked to me about you know writing something about c sharp and i was like yeah i don't know maybe i'm not sure i want to write a book again and said that Scott Myers at the time was just starting to open up his and start his effective software development series. Um, and if you're familiar with C++, you know, Scott Myers works on effective C++ or like some of the most read C++ books. So I jumped at the opportunity to write effective C Sharp and that worked well. And then started working on the next one. Um, which is one of the fun anecdotes of uh, responding to to change. I had already signed the contract to do more effective C sharp, and I was had the outline all approved, and I was working on on the release. And I went to the 2005 PDC, and all the content that I put together was for C sharp two and what had kind of been leaked a little bit about C sharp three, and I thought I liked the outline and where it was going. And the opening keynote of uh, the 2005 PDC had Anders Helsberg showing the world link for the first time, which I, I had never seen. That was really pretty private. Very few, almost no one outside of Microsoft had seen a preview of it before the PDC. And I'm sitting in the third row and I'm starting to take notes like this is really awesome. This is this incredible stuff they're adding to the language. And about 40 minutes into the keynote, I realized my current outline for this book is complete and total crap. And no one is gonna buy it because I'm not covering any of this stuff. So after the conference and talking with Anders and going through a lot of the things and, and coming up with a new outline, I talked to my editor. And my editor is going, you know, we have we have deadlines, we have a date, you, you can't do this. And I'm going, And I'm sitting there saying, there is no one that is going to buy this book unless I cover this new content. And we argued about this and, and my writing slowed down because I really was no longer excited about the original outline. And I kept arguing with her. And finally, I got a six month um, delay. So they literally pulled the printing out of a couple of the uh, printing schedule out of a couple of the, of the book, pub, book printers reworked the outline, reworked the content. Uh, turned out that was right because it did outsell the first book by two to one and uh, uh, went back on that. And and again, that's like looking at a plan and seeing it's it, it no longer makes sense. And then you have to change the plan. Um, and it doesn't matter how good you think the plan is. If it's if you can see it's wrong, it's wrong. Um, and, I, and I think that was probably the big lesson there. And then from that, 
since then, any of the things that I've been doing have been updating those for newer releases as the language has grown. Uh, the most recent one, I really took a big chunk and reorganized a lot of both of them. Um, and says a lot about the language and that the titles and the recommendations of what you should do are pretty much the same, but um, how you achieve different goals, there's a lot better ways to do things than what I wrote in 2005 or 2007. I mean, uh, uh, the thought, the has like, 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 like a roller coaster <laughs> and thrillers <laughs> and, and, and then and then you just stop and then you thought it's not good then then you then you restructure the whole thing and did it again i mean wow that takes courage that takes a lot of courage i'm, I'm inspired by you already i'm just um this is this is really inspiring this conversation is teaching me a lot so uh coming up with the next important question so you have been working in microsoft as a senior content developer and uh, has been awarded the most uh, valued professional for like 11 times now how has this journey been and what's the most different thing that you find about microsoft the most favorite um. part Wow. So um, as an MVP, you're outside of Microsoft, um, but you're kind of one of the trusted people who gets access to some early releases and gets to give early feedback to product teams. And so I joined Microsoft four years ago, or yeah, a little more than four years ago now. Um, um, Sacha's leadership, I think, is one of the biggest things. And I think it's... Um, I would not say this is just something, you know, Sacha and Balmer are two totally different people. I think it's also the time, you know, not having the Department of Justice going after them changes what you can do. Um, and and I think Balmer's skills were right for that time. And as you look at now, it's, it's much more technology focused. And the biggest difference, I think, is the way we do so many more things in the open. Everybody gets treated the way we used to be treated just as MVPs. In that now, anybody who's interested in the product development or in how certain areas evolve can go onto GitHub and make their voice heard. Um, and just like when we were MVPs and we would give feedback to the product teams it doesn't mean they're going to do what you say but it does mean they're going to listen and take into consideration what you're thinking um you know and especially if it's voiced wisely um yeah, you know yeah. and with 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 real things behind it um you know rants don't work and they don't work now but if you can say you know this feature is not going to help me, and the reason it's not going to help me is the way it's designed. This is harder, and it runs into these things, and and so on. Those that kind of feedback definitely gets looked at, and and really gets thought about hard. Yeah. So, um, well, for like advices for people who are going for an internship now or starting with one, and how like searching for one as well, how to focus more, how to be productive enough, and how to choose that those skills, those those particular skills that we actually can work wonders in. How did you choose yours? Um, I would look for the intersections of things that you're really interested in and things that look like they are going to be successful. And, and and then uh, a, a side trip a little bit as to just how possible you think they are. Um, in that, you know, as I look at the ones that, that worked well, and, and not everything worked well, I honestly, I, I still miss my Windows phone. I think it was a better user experience than either the iPhone or the Android. Um, and there were a couple others along the way that I thought were going to do better than they did. And I can't, it's been too long since I've worked with them, I don't remember right now. Bye. Um, but look for something that looks like it's going to get some momentum, 
which doesn't always necessarily mean it's from a big company. Like if I were looking at software languages right now, I would really look at Go. I think there's some very interesting things in the Go language. Um, and I would look at things that are really interesting to you. You know, if you like machine learning, that's a super rich area and there's going to be a lot of things there. Um, putting computers in more and more different kinds of devices, the Internet of Things and how that relates to different areas, I think it's going to be huge. Um, uh, you know, and that, that also plays into electronics and device measurement and so on. There's going to be, you know, sensors everywhere measuring things and, and hopefully helping us do things better. And if that's interesting, you know, whether it's medicine or um, hardware engineering or physical infrastructure, so on, I think we're going to see more things there. Um, you know, and, and I'm, I know I'm leaving a lot of things out because there's a lot of things I don't watch super closely. But I would look at things that you find interesting and fun and who looks like they're making interesting progress there and, and which and which ones this just would be fun to get up and do the work. Um, and then mix that in with the skills and with what you like doing. Um, you know, in, in my case, what I like doing the most is helping other people grow. So, you know, you go back to whether it's the writing where people read what I, what I say and hopefully they think they've learned things from it. Um, you know, speaking at conferences, same kind of thing. I, hopefully they learn and get something from the things that I, I show them. Uh, teaching classes, same kind of thing. And, um, you know, when we were growing the company, the part I liked the most was when we were hiring newer, younger, or inexperienced engineers and helping them grow to be more more senior, more capable engineers. That was the part I really just enjoyed getting up and doing. And then, you know, keep looking for how you can spend more of your day doing those things. That's, that's great. Uh, any tips that you would want to uh, give to the developers that those are coming up, those, those are graduated this year or who are in the final year, anything? Um, Make the most of any opportunity that you do get. Um, it's a sadly unique experience, but I think your your class is going to have a lot of unique experiences to lean on, you know, different than um, a lot of other people. And while there's a lot of things that aren't great about that experience, you know, we're working with a team of interns right now that are all at home. They don't get to experience campus they don't get to do some of the social things that often get done that get done every year for interns because they're just not there um you know the the people running the intern program are trying to do everything they can to make a good experience but it's definitely different um and see what you can learn from that uh and then beyond that see see what you can do to make that better i think that actually is going to be a very interesting you know, one, one positive that could come out of the current situation is um, maybe a few years from now, place doesn't matter as much as it once did. And that could be really cool for people all around the world, honestly. Um, and, uh, and that could be a real positive. And maybe, you know, it's, it's your generation that helps bring that, you know, bring that forth more. So, um, so the last round that we have is the fire question round. You will have to answer in a single word. So, like a one word answer is going to be a fun activity. And I guess I had your permission for this. Sure. So, um, yeah. So, so, shall we start? Sure. Okay. So, your favorite album? Music I'm album. Sorry? Your favorite music album? Favorite music album? Ah, uh, boy. Um, Layla and other assorted love songs. Uh, it's an old Eric Clapton, Derek and the Dominoes album. Sorry, that's a lot more than one word, but. <laughs> <laughs> Favorite singer. Favorite singer. Uh, Emily Haynes. She's from oh, uh, wow. Metric, Canadian band. Okay, great. Um, favorite game? Any game? Favorite game. Um, uh, da, 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 da. It's uh, Settlers of Catan. Okay, and uh, what's the most played instrument that you have? Like, 
yeah, played the most. Yeah, uh, definitely the guitar. Um, it's probably the only instrument I play, although I have four of them. Um, so the one I play the most is a Strat, uh, followed by I have a 12-string Martin that I play when it's acoustic music mostly. Wow, <laughs> And the most blissful activity in your job? The most blissful one? Like, the most you are blissful activity that you do in your daily job that makes you do it more, that makes you wake up every day. I guess uh, you sort of said that earlier. <laughs> um, yeah, the biggest thing for me is, is being to do cool things that I think is going to make it really engaging for new people to learn .NET and learn C Sharp and make it yeah. exciting and make it fun. That's great. Okay. I am so honored to have you here, Bill, and your story is so inspiring. It's everything that, everything, each and every part of your life and each and every journey of yours has, as I said, is a roller coaster itself. And there's so much to learn. We, we people stop working when we see failures. And I guess your story probably tells us not to. And that would be so encouraging for people around here who will watch this episode. I'm so glad to have you. And um, yeah, so guys, let's. Wrap, it, wrap up this episode and we'll wait up for the reviews and the comments and definitely I would want more and more comments and uh, how this thing could evolve and get better and wait for the next session.